uh, met me yet. I just started last in, in January as the new with science, extension with scientist with the University of Arizona. So my predecessor is Bill McCloskey and uh, I guess one of the main difference between my current situation and Bill is that I'm based in Maricopa, whereas Bill was based in Tucson. So my, my goal for today is Blaze did a very, very good job talking about Palmer Emerald biology management and really, you know, highlighting what are, how, what are the issues and uh, why we believe this is a major threat to our cotton industry in the state. And since most of the folks in the talk ha have never met me, I thought that maybe I will just very briefly introduce myself. It's just one slide. And then I will, uh, actually my main goal for today is, you know, I'm still, I think my main goal for my first six months in the job is really trying to understand you know, the industry interaction with you few guys so I can really identify what are the needs and what are the areas that I really need to focus my, my efforts, my applied research and extension program. And, I, and then at the end, I will just briefly make some con considerations about some of, you know, not hot topics, but some of the challenges and issues that we have been uh, listening a lot that might be some extra worries for us to start thinking and planning ahead for this year. So very briefly, I'm from Brazil. I got my bachelor's in agronomy, and in 2019, I, sorry, in 2015, actually, I came to the United States for my PhD. So I got my PhD in agronomy with folks in wheat science at the University of Florida. And actually, it was at the University of Florida that I started my, my being exposure, my, being, my exposure and being exposed to wheat science. So I did an internship with the Brent Sellers at a range cattle research and education center in Florida. We were looking at integrated with management in, in perennial grass pastures and rangelands. And that gave me the opportunity to come back and do my PhD in the same field. We were looking at invasive perennial grass management in Bahia grass pastures. And I also got, I guess I forgot to say before that, I did my master's in, in sugarcane production in Brazil, looking at herbicide selectivity for different planting systems. And then right after my PhD, I, I got a very nice experience. It was a very cool experience, but uh, it gave me the opportunity to work a little bit more closely with our annual row crops. Uh, I was in Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin. I did a, a mainly working with weed management in silage corn, alfalfa, and cool season grass pastures as well. Now, last year, I was a University of California Cooperative and Extension Farm Advisor in the San Joaquin Valley. So it was a great experience for me to be, you know, being a little bit more transition from the academic world to some of more real world uh, interactions with growers and uh, developing more applied research. And I do have a very, I will not pretend that I'm a cotton expert at this point, I'm, I'm, but I'm planning to be get there very quickly. But I just want to say I, have a, I had an, one year, one growing season experience in, with cotton in the San Joaquin Valley, and it was actually the hybrid, the Hazera hybrid, one of the main uh, planted cultivars there. So a very, very different weed management program. We do not have as, as all those herbicide traits that we, we do have availability here in Arizona. So, like I said, I guess for me, one of my main goals during my first year is to really identify and understand what are the main challenges, what are the, the, the wheat science and wheat management related issues that I should focus. And I hope that I can actually get a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with you guys this year and, 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 and see and being exposure to all those different problems throughout the state. And the other thing that uh, it would really help me if you guys could please do it. And there is no hard feelings if he, nobody does it, but I'm just, it's, it's, it's just would be very helpful for me. I know that you guys are always, uh, how can I say, uh, in, uh, you have uh, lots of requests for service during the, the, the year. So that will be another one. I try to make it a little bit more less painful and easier. It should take five to seven minutes. It's all multiple questions. And the way that you get access, that you can access the survey, it's if you can see my screen right now, if you have a smartphone, just open the camera for your smartphone, point to this QR code here on the bottom right corner, and it should 
something should pop up in your screen, you click on that little icon and then it will you know, automatically open a, a, a link and uh, you can just click on the squares for the multiple question, uh, multiple choice questions. And I'm mean, also planning to use the, the survey that many of you have already done at the beginning of the year with Peter's uh, past loss program. So that would be just a, a compliment because uh, I do have some, a little, some different questions. So with that being said, uh, I do have some ideas and, and you know, things that I, I believe that will probably be necessary to, to work. And you know the number one probably not just for cotton but in, in in general for my program, one area that I really plan to put some effort is to work with herbicide resistance management. And what I mean by that, so my, number one, it's how can we deal, how can we properly manage our fields where we do already have the presence of resist herbicide resistant weeds. But maybe even more importantly, is how can we do, what can we do to delay the onset of new cases of herbicide resistance and, and how can we also delay the spread of the cases that we have identified and that's that's uh so that's one of the things that we, i'm already working with blaze so here i will not put a lot of time on, on this project but i guess uh it's very important for us to understand what what's happening so uh where are the main problematic areas? What are the herbicide mold affections that we are seeing some uh, increase in difficulties in controlling? And uh, what can we do about it to avoid it, to get it worse? So that comes the second part of the, I believe we should really put some efforts, which is the developing integrated management strategies and you know, investigating how can we properly adopt them in a, in a way that it's feasible and economically viable. And the, the reason why, so why, why, why are we talking so much about herbicide resistance? What is the issue? Why do we care? Well, I guess that there are many reasons why that's, that's a problem, but mainly because it will reduce our, the number of viable herbicide options, which will in, in results in changes in our managing practices, which will lead to increasing costs, and of course, loss of potential yield and income. And so when and then think about the reduction in the the number of effective options that we have. So what what do we know in terms of Palmer Amaran? So this every time I, that's I just look at this morning. So it keeps increasing. But as of February two thousand twenty-two, that's not so across the United States. We have populations of Palmer Amaran that have been identified with resistance to nine different modes of action. So I'm not saying that uh, you know we have a, all of populations will be resistant to all of those different chemistries and different modes of action, but we do have populations that have resistance to to them. And in many cases, that's that's a uh, one example from a Palmer population collecting in, in cotton fields in Arkansas that they confirm resistance to five different modes of action. And then when, and then we have another example in cotton in, in, in Kansas with resistance to glyphosate and dicamba, one of our elksin uh, synthetic herbicides and probably one of the, you know, this entire group, 214 dicamba, it's one of our over the top few options that we have that are effective. So that's very uh, concerning, very alarming. And the goal, the, the, the whole goal, the whole idea with you know, us looking at fields now and doing all those herbicide screenings and developing all those integrated strategies is to avoid getting to that point. And the other reason why it's so important for us to do as, as, as much as we can to preserve the effective tools that we currently have is that herbicides are not easy to come around. If you think about the last time that a true new mode of action was uh, developed and released, that was, I guess, this year is making 40 years ago. It was in 1982, uh, uh, our group 27 PPG inhibitor. So it is very, it's very, it's very important to preserve our effective tools as much as we can. And uh, that's what we are trying to accomplish with this project. Uh, Blaze have already done a very good job covering that. And you know, I think that's extremely important to avoid early detection will help us to avoid uh, early spread 
and it will help us to save costs and you know being more uh, uh, mindful and effective with the herbicide choice that we make. So I hope that you guys are not getting too bored of listening about Palmer Amaranth after almost 30 minutes, 40 minutes in a row. The reason why uh, you know we have been talking about Palmer Amaranth is because weed management depends on our weed species present in the field. And Palmer Amaranth, it's one of the main drivers for weed management and one of the main, most problematic in terms of resistance. So that's that's why we have been putting so much effort and, and time on talk about herbicide, uh, Palmer Amaranth management in herbicide resistant best management practices. But there are many other problems in channels out there. Uh, you know, maybe some of those weed species are not as problematic in cotton. I just give you some examples like hair flibane and horseweed. They are very susceptible to, you know, soil disturbance. disturbance. So with all our tillage and, and, and even our in-season cultivations, that in general is not as much of of a huge concern in cotton, but it is a, a problem in many other crops, especially in, in our perennial tree nut crops. So, and the other reason why I've, I'm interested in, in starting working with those plants or weeds is because, you know, they have been, there has been a herbicide resistant cases confirmed uh, for those in our neighboring states. And I'm, unfortunately, I think that even though we haven't confirmed yet in, in Arizona, that doesn't mean that they are not out there. And so the second part of my program is that I really wanted to put some effort and you know start developing some science-based recommendations for our growers is integrate, integrated weed management products. And Blaze did a very good job talking on that. I'm just gonna not put a lot of time. And I agree with Blaze, maybe the gophers might not be a good idea. And I, I also don't think I wanna put a lot of time in developing you know, plants using geese, even though they have been used in the past and they are particularly fond of some annual grass weed species, uh, I guess crabgrass. Uh, really, we need to think about how can we best you know, co combine, uh, how can we help our chemical program, which uh, it's our, carrying most of the weight, but how can we help our chemical program with some of those other possible strategies? And again, herbicides are extremely important. We are, we, we, we are not saying that we don't wanna, we are gonna give up of our herbicide options. We, we, we wanna use our other methods to help us to preserve our chemical options. And the other thing that it's very important to do to preserve our effective options is to use it in a way that is, I'm saying, sustainable herbicide program. And what I mean by that is, you know, we wanna decrease the selection pressure of any, of any specific strategy. So what, one of the best ways to de decrease selection pressure in our post-emergence applications is using pre-emergent herbicides. That link that I put, and you know, the main benefits, herbicide resistance, it's sometimes it sounds a little bit complicated, but it's, it's not that complicated. It's, it's, it's all a numbers game. So everything that we can do to have less weeds by the time of our post-emergent herbicide applications, and in, even you know, also making sure that they are, will be smaller or lower, that all contributes to our herbicide you know, resistance management. And you know, uh, the use of our PPIs, herbicides, prow, trifuralin, it's extremely important. I'm interested in, in also, we, we do have some other herbicides that could be used in, in that specific timing. We have uh, Keparo, we have uh, some of uh, group 15 herbicides. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I really want to put some tries looking at the difference between using one or multiple modes of actions, because we want to try to, you know, we don't want to put as much pressure in, in always in one side of action. As you remember in my previous slide, we have Palmer Amaran populations in other states that are resistant to our group three or DNA yellow herbicides. So that's one of the things I would like to do this year. Uh, I would really like to try to make, you know, try to identify some how to make in-season uh, residual herbicide applications more viable with all the issues of incorporation. And in, that's something that I'm still learning. I do not, I will be honest, I do not currently know exactly how widely uh, livery or glufosinate is used in our uh, in our crops that allow over the top application of livery. My experience in California is that is not as popular as it is in other 
areas of the, of, of the United States, uh, mainly because of our, our you know, weather and climate conditions. But uh, I'm very interested in trying to investigate how can we make uh, you know, more efficient use of our liberty. Uh, you know, it is a very, very finicky herbicide. People say that uh, you need to spray in banking hours. So from 9 a.m. to 4, 4 p.m., you need to have good coverage. Uh, some, you, it's very good when you have the addition of AMS, but then that brings other issues with the other products and all the, the you know, legal tank mixing uh, combinations. But uh, I'm very interested in trying to optimize the use of, of glufosinate because we do need, you know, we need more than, than, than dicamb and 2,4-D the, as effective over-the-top options. And, and the picture here in the upper left corner is just, a, you know, that's one, uh, some somewhat new red ball hooded sprayer that allow us to spray over the top with hood sprayers. So it's a little bit different than our lay by hooded sprayers. And you know, if you're spraying at midday glufosinate, glufosinate is, it is a challenge because we have you know, lots of wind issues. That might be one way that it will allow us to not only have overall better you know, on target applications, but also help with you know, maybe increasing the value and use of Liberty. Just an idea. And yes, Blaze did a great job with here. There are many things I think we can do. I'm very, very interested in cover crops and trying to integrate it with conservation of tillage and no-till. In terms of tillage, uh, the, the good old mold board plow, you know, deep tillage, we have many ex experiences in other states in Georgia where they show us that if you do that, you know, not every year, but if you do that every four years, it, it can really help us to bury very down or deep down in the soil profile, our seeds. And, you know, that's another thing that I'm very interested. I'm, you know, I'm thinking as the sixth part of our integrated weed management plan is the, the use of alternative methods for weed control. So a lot of precision egg, you know, every year we are seeing more uh, use of UAV uh, drones and mapping, not only for mapping, but also for site specific uh, applications. They are getting more affordable. They are getting a little bit easier to use. And I do plan to, you know, include that in my research programs. And the one that I, I have one extra slide here for you guys is the, you know, electric weed control. That's something that uh, I, I borrowed this slide from Dr. Kevin Bradley and the rest of Missouri. And so the idea here is that we are, you know, using this copper boom attached in the front of the tractor and we have this uh, power generate, PTO uh, generator, uh, you know, in the back of the tractor. And the idea is that every single plant that touches that copper boom will be electrocuted, if you will. And it's uh, very effective even for tall uh, weeds. Uh, you know, some research in Missouri is showing that maybe it, it is very effective in a cousin of Palmer Amaranth, water hemp, and may, it is effective on Palmer, but uh, not as much as in water hemp. But the main idea here is that, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting to wait uh, until mid-season when the plants will be taller than your crop, and then you go out there and then you use this. But I, I think that it has extremely uh, value to be used in, in opportunities as a, a rescue type of treatment just to avoid soil seed bank replenishment. So let's say all those you know, individual plants that escaped all the previous management strategies, and maybe instead of having to go there and, and hand weeding them, we can use this and kill all those possible herbicide resistant plants that, uh, that uh, survived our, our previous efforts. And even the plants that have already put seeds, their research has shown that the seed viability decreases significantly. So I think that there is, that is opportunities for using this as a seed harvest treatment, as a, just a way to avoid seed coming back to the seed bank. And like, like Blaze also mentioned, uh, maybe 85, 90% of the seeds will, will stay viable in the soil just in the first three years. So. Yes, there is a lot of seeds, even 10 person is still a lot, but it's all about selection pressure. If we can do that three years in a row and making sure that no seeds are coming, you know, returning to the soil seed bank, it's gonna, we are, we are setting ourselves to a much better situation for a more, you know, easy, easier effective management in the following seasons. And then- Jose, you've got two minutes. Two be perfect. Thank you, Randy. So two minutes, I just wanna briefly touch some of the hot, you know, things that I have been listening from my colleagues. 
And even some growers already called me and asking me what are some of the th things to do this season. So there is a, you know, there are, you know, serious issues with the herbicide shortage and increasing in prices this year, particularly for glyphosate and glufosinate. So I would just say, maybe, you know, some of the things you should consider is that uh, save some of your potassium salt glyphosate formulations for your dichematillidin crops. Uh, you know, be more flexible about how you can use glyphosate. Sometimes you, you don't need to have a glyphosate, you know, only product. You can still have access to glyphosate in, in some premixes. Uh, maybe there are some bads that comes for good. Now, I guess, you know, you, using other herbicides might, might, in helping with overall herbicide resistance management, might be a very good thing to consider as well. Uh, not just because of the price, but that's an extra, you know, incentive, I would say. Uh, if you have, you know, uh, consider other herbicides. If you have issue, glyphosate uh, was your main herbicide for controlling your grasses, maybe you, you have some other options in cotton. You can use our group one herbicides, Selectimax, Post, or Fusolate. And just to finish, I, I thought that it was a, a, a very interesting thing that uh, my, my predecessor in California shared this slide with me. So basically, this, that, that, this research back in 1968, which was the kind of the early ages of herbicide, synthetic herbicide discovery and, and development. So basically they said, well, there is, I guess, herbicides are such a tremendous good tool that, you know, there is no real reason for me to think that in the next 10 to 20 years, our is gonna be, you know, completely weed free fields are gonna be a common site. And they could, you know, we all know that they could not be more wrong. Uh, weeds are extremely resilient and any, any, herb, any management that we adopt, not just herbicides, uh, any management, if you don't use that properly, if you put, if you rely on that management too much, we are going to end up losing. And we want to keep as many as effective tools as we can 